สวัสดีค่ะ Good Friday evening and welcome to Thai PBS World tonight. I am Natha g o m o n w a t i n live from the Thai, P- Thai PBS studio, and Kun t e p Chai Yong is now joining me live from home. Kun t e p Chai, today in about three hours time, it's curfew time nationwide. That's right. Uh, I believe that many people are now in the rush to get home to and beating the the curfew hours. Which will begin uh, at 10 p.m. tonight and will last until 5 a.m. the next day. Uh, Kunta, but I'm sure that there are still a lot of people out there who are still confused as to the application of the exemption to the curfew announced by the government yesterday. Yes, there must be some confusion. So, shall we take a look at for the exemption of the curfew because? For people who are preparing for tonight, they may be confused what they have to do after 10 o'clock tonight when curfew is in place. So, for exemption of the curfew, so let's take a look. Who can get some exemption? Medical and banking personnel, people who need medical attention. Personnel transporting essential goods and medical equipment. Pharmaceutical products, agricultural produce, fuel, newspaper, and mail packages. Kun t e p c h a i Yes, sir. so these are among the people and professions uh, which and who are exempted from the curfew. Including people working for late shifts and people on their way to and from airports. But uh, could Mr. Lukre Nam, the Deputy Prime Minister in charge of legal affairs, try to qualify, clarify the the exemptions today? Of course, he I think he understood that uh, there are a lot of questions out there as to what these exemption, uh, how these exemptions will apply because. He noted that for these people to to be qualified for exemption, they need to have to carry with them personal identification cards and including certifying documents from their employees for their employers, which is this is something that is uh, that has r e s e r v a t i o n because we still still not quite clear as to what kind of documents that could be considered to be. Uh, certifying documents that would exempt these people from from the curfew. So uh, I think there will be a lot of a confusion out there tonight when people are stopped at checkpoints and asked to produce uh, documents that are needed to exempt them from the curfew. That's right. And for reporters or member of media community who have to work late night night shift tonight, for example, at the Thai PBS, we have collected a list of number of people who has to go home after 10 o'clock after midnight, like myself, who will have to do the n e Thai PBS program tonight. We have got certificate of letter from the Thai PBS already, so we have yes. to show it and with our ID as well to make sure that the police officer know what we have been doing. The when reporters ask o n v i s i t o r today whether journalists are exempted from the the curfew, we said no, no. Journalists are not supposed to be out on the street uh, doing news stories at that time of the night. So it's still uh, not very clear as to how k u n a t a and your colleagues uh, will be treated tonight when you are stopped at checkpoints. Yes. So we have to get better, get ourselves ready, just in case we have been called to stop. So we have to show evidence what we have. And, uh, yeah, and of course today's uh, journalists are quite curious of what the about the hours of the curfew. Of course, the question is why between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m., which are not the normal hours for most people, anyways. So the explanation from Kun w i s e n o was that uh, the government want to be seen as being tough with uh, with implementing measures to deal with the virus. And on the other hand, the government also doesn't want to want to have this to have too much impact on the daily life of the people. That's why it initially chose the hours between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. for the curfew 
to ensure that uh, there won't be many people out there on the streets during those hours, and that the curfew would have minimum impact on the livelihood of the people. That's right. And right now, a group of reporters from Thai PBS have been stationed in many spots around Bangkok, in many locations around the country, to try to monitor what will be coming out tonight after curfew at 10 o'clock. And Kun Visano said today that the government will be assessing the consequence or the impact of the curfew on a daily basis. And he hinted that if the situation doesn't improve. That means if the number of infections do not drop, doesn't, doesn't come down, then the, the government might have to increase the hours, the number of hours for the curfew. Today is six hours, right? But Kun Bistro said it could go up to eight hours, 10 hours, or even more than that. And today the spokeswoman of the government house also hinted at the possibility of a 24-hour curfew if things really got, get that bad and, and the government need, really need to, to do something more drastic than, than it is doing already. That's right. Government spokeswoman said, actually, Prime Minister Prayut Chan Ocha doesn't want to adopt that bitter pill to that level of 24-hour of curfew. But if it's necessary, he perhaps might have to make a decision to do so. So we are not far from the situation of 24-hour curfew. So it would be dependent on what will happen this weekend, I guess, after the curfew has been in place from 10 p.m. tonight. And Dr. Vesanu today jokingly said that curfew doesn't have holidays and doesn't know the hour of the days or night. So and it is not selective in striking at the victim. So uh, anyone can get infected at any time of the day or night. So that's why he was uh, suggesting that uh, if things don't improve, so the number of hours of the curfew could be increased. I mean, to ensure that uh, the government is full, in full control of the movement of the people. Yes, because virus is working around the clock 24 hours a day and it doesn't know boundary at all for the coronavirus. But the situation in Phuket, Kuntep Chai, is quite alarming. Today, the case of new infection is 13 and bring the total number of infection in Phuket to 100 already. So they have to impose stricter measure on Phuket to ask all the hotel to close down for all visitors right now to try to curb the spread of virus as much as they can. Yeah, this is quite alarming because the, as of today, Phuket now has, be, has not the highest rate of infections in the country, considering the small uh, population of the island. The island has about 422,000 people, and its uh, infection rate now is 21 persons per 100,000 people, and now it's considered to have the highest infection rate in the country. And as Kun Nata mentioned, that now, now the, the province has registered at least 100 infection cases. And, uh, and many of these uh, infected persons are foreigners, are expats living in, in Phuket. Under the order, guests already staying in hotel may stay until their scheduled departure date but hotels are not allowed to accept new guests from tomorrow. So hotel management are required to report details of their remaining guests to district officials so that health officers can screen them and monitor their condition. So that's the strict measure, the toughest one ever happened in Phuket up until now. Yeah. So among the three districts in Phuket uh, which have registered, the highest rates of infections are Katu, of course, we are all familiar with Katu, one of the most popular tourist uh, spots. Katu and followed by Mueang district of Phuket and then uh, Talang district. So these are the three districts of the province that have registered the highest rate of uh, infection. That's right. It's part of the result of 
the whole province lockdown would happen from the very beginning of this week. And from the 10th of April, the air transportation will have to be closed down as well, to have to be shut down as well to link to Phuket. Yeah. And now let's take a look at the overall picture of the coronavirus outbreak. Today, the Public Health Ministry reported another 103 new cases of infections with four deaths. And now, and this, this has raised the total number of infections in the country to 1,978. And what is quite alarming is that uh, the four fatalities reported today are elderly people. The youngest was a 59-year-old employee of the State Railway of Thailand. And the other three deaths were also elderly people with pre-existing chronic illnesses. The first was a 72-year-old man whose son had visited a boxing stadium in Bangkok. And then the, another was 84 years old, and he worked at the Random Nerd Boxing Stadium, also in Bangkok. And the other was eight, also 84, who had visited the same boxing stadium. So Kunata is very clear that uh, boxing stadiums have been a major source of infection. And that is the reason why the government decided to have all sporting venues closed. Yes, and another case that we all have to be aware of, and non Tabari Provincial Health Office is seeking passengers from Thai Airways International TG917 flight from London to Bangkok on March 27th to March 28th. The passengers are asked to contact the health office immediately because three passengers were found to be infected with the deadly virus and all crew members of TG-917 flights have already been quarantined. So the three passengers who were on the flight, that flight, should contact the health official as much as they can because they were infected with the coronavirus. And yeah. other people who have been in contact with them right now will be probably under risk of infection. Kunatat Songkran Festival, of course, is going to be a much torn down festival this year. It's only less than two weeks away. And of course, we all know that uh, Thai people have this tradition of paying respects to old people, right? And Dr. Thubi Sin, Mr. Nuk Yotin, the spokesman of the center fighting against the coronavirus, today has something to say about this tradition. He said, since elderly people account for, account for the majority of the fatalities so far, he strongly advises people to try to keep a distance between them and their elderly family members. But of course, he knows that this could prove to be difficult to do, right? Because the Songkran Festival is, is uh, around the corner and it's, a, it's the occasion where Thai people observe the tradition of paying respects to the elderly by pouring water on their hands and getting blessings from them, which means that they will be in very, very close proximity. And as much as uh, he wants to see Thai people carry on with the tradition, Dr. Tobi Sin today, however, insisted that health and safety is now the top priority. So his advice to the Thai people is that a proper distance should be kept between the young family members and the elderly, of course, in line with the social distancing guideline. And instead of using water to pour on the hands of the elderly to pay respects, how about using hand sanitizers on the elderly instead? So this is his advice out of a concern for safety and health of the families who will be, of course, I mean, celebrating Songkran in a scaled-down manner anyway. Yes, because it's very important tradition in Thailand. Every 13 to 15 of April, it's traditional water splash festival in Thailand. So this mm. year, it means disruption of this tradition. But Dr. Tuwisin has offered creativity in <laughs> respecting the elderly, which is part and 
very important yeah. matter as the meaningful of the tradition. Yeah, and Dr. Tibisin today also had, had another, another warning to, to, to Thai people. He said, even though old people might be more vulnerable to the virus, he cautioned that young people should not develop a false sense of security, believing that they are more immune to the disease. He pointed out that the, the COVID-19 has been spreading among young people in the 20 to 29 age group in the past one month. The reason? Because this group of people tend to travel a lot and are drawn to having gatherings and parties, thus exposing themselves to potential infection. So young people are not much safer from the disease than older people. This is a warning from Dr. Tim Eason. Kuntep Chai and Thai authority has also announced to ban all the foreign arrivals to Thailand with, in which the order is in place already. And right now we have Deputy Spokesman of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Kun Natha Panut Nopakun, is joining us live. Good evening, Deputy Natha Panut. Hello. I think we still, uh, I think we have lost connection. I'm okay. sure that uh, yes. uh, the deputy spokesman would we have a lot to say to explain to expect foreigners in Thailand who maybe are, who certainly are asking a lot of questions about the curfew that will take effect uh, starting at 10 p.m. tonight. Yes, then, that's right. Course, yeah, and then questions about Thailand being locked down with the with, uh, arrivals from overseas going to be scaled out or altered. That's right. Our team is trying to get him back to have video call with us, Kun Natapanu Nopakun, Deputy Spokesman of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because there must be lots of questions regarding curfew and visa extension. So, Kun Natapanu Nopakun, thank you very much for joining us. Hello, thank you. Nice to see you again. Can you hear me well? Yes, very yeah, well. You can. Yeah, very well. How are you doing? Um, well, I'm doing fine, uh, energetic, and then I think we'll fight on. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so what's the questions you have got in the past few days? Is it about curfew or the ban of foreign arrivals? Yes, um, many questions actually about uh, curfew, uh, who it covers, who is exempted, um, and the details of the curfew, uh, as well as questions like, for example, about the uh, recommendation to uh, postpone and travel into Thailand. Those are the main uh, questions. So let's start with curfew then. What, what are the most common questions about curfew from foreigners and expats? Yes, for, firstly, we, um, there was one concern about if the curfew would affect uh, trade, actually, the movement of goods, because business has to go on. So, actually, the curfew uh, would not affect uh, trade in terms of the transport of goods for uh, import and export or for the movement of goods, which are uh, to make everyday life uh, possible, like, you know, of, of, money in banks or, or gasoline uh, or uh, commodities, uh, uh, food delivery and, and things like that, that, that will still be um, allowed during the curfew. Uh, but uh, in terms of the general uh, curfew, of course, it's 2200 hours to 0400 hours for all, uh, all, all citizens and, and, and people in Thailand. And what about the issue of ban of foreign arrivals? Yes, um, there was a, an announcement, a directive, uh, seeking for the cooperation of all persons to postpone their travel into Thailand until the 15th of April. Uh, that is because the information had been realized uh, points to the fact that most of the cases are uh, imported cases. Uh, imported cases, either from Thai persons or foreign persons traveling in inbound into Thailand. So, so the Prime Minister announced uh, this uh, request for cooperation, a recommendation to postpone travel until after April 15th. So I noticed that you you have been careful not to use the word lockdown or 
bad. I mean, as far as uh, foreigners traveling to Thailand are concerned. So, what? How should we describe the, the, the measure? Yes, uh, if you if it's it's up to the word um, lockdown or closing off uh, the country, uh, uh, I, I I recommend that we, we don't use that word because in reality it is not closing off the country. The airport is in fact still uh, open, um, although the recommendation is to postpone travel inbound uh, um, until 15th of April, but outbound of course. And the airports are still open. Uh, the businesses are um, just there is a curfew, and then there's a, there's a recommendation to postpone travel. Um, it's not a full lockdown of the country, um, but of course, as Kuntetai mentioned, it, it's uh, the government will be assessing this uh, day by day. It's kind of difficult when when you have to balance many things, so keeping life uh, as normal as well as trying to stop the spread of, of the virus at the same time. It's a delicate yeah. balance. Mm. So can we describe it as a partial lockdown? Mm. I still wouldn't say partial lockdown. I would still say uh, restrictions in travel and very cautious uh, measures, for example, curfew. Okay, that's it. Yeah. And, and what, need a lot of, uh, need a lot of interpretation. <laughs> and what about Thai who live abroad and who still want to come home? They cannot do so from now on. Yes, um, the Thai, well, Thai, Thais have the uh, constitutional right to return to their country, of course. Uh, but in this trying, in these trying times, in this situation, I think everybody. A, 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 a short temporary postponement of travel inbound is necessary in their country. Okay, um, so in, in practice, the Thai embassies abroad have already reached out to the uh, Thai uh, community uh, around the world uh, to recommend this uh, postponement, or it's a temporary postponement uh, of, of uh, travel. Um, and this has been done through uh, social media as well as direct contact. At uh, easy to understand infographic for the Thai uh, uh, people abroad. The, the registration, there was a registration for those who wanted uh, certificates from the embassy to return. That has been uh, frozen temporarily until the 15th of April as well. So, so uh, is it right for me to understand that the 15th of April is just the, the uh, sort of uh, a initial time frame? And this can change depending on situation with devil, right? Yes, I, I would say so. And uh, Deputy, Deputy Natapanu, right now we still see the photo image circulating in social media of when the foreign visitor or foreigners in Thailand who would like to have visa extension, they, they may not would like to, but they feel that they still have to extend the visa and the queue is quite long and packed at immigration office. So what do you like to tell them or what's the other measures to help them in terms of visa extension right now? Yes, the government um, understands the situation, the global situation. Some then at the moment not return to their countries or have difficulty in returning to their countries. Um, I mentioned the other day about the possible uh, extension of uh, tourist visas. Uh, that is in the pipeline. Uh, so, frankly speaking, uh, the details are being ironed out by. So, what I have to say is that uh, definitely, uh, the, to tell you frankly, um, this is, is on the agenda. Uh, the Prime Minister is aware. And if, if the Prime Minister is aware, it just takes a bit of time to trickle down to uh, have implementable uh, policies. Uh, we see in the news every day about lines in immigration, not only at Chiang uh, Wai or, or uh, in Bangkok, but in uh, the other provinces uh, as well. Yes, so it's just a matter of uh, time uh, that uh, this will uh, happen, and we'll, we'll be able to facilitate um, the, for the foreign uh, uh, persons who are requesting to uh, extend their, their visas. Uh, so, look, uh, if I am a, if I am someone in one of the say European countries, I walk into uh, the Thai embassy there or Thai consulate there and say, I want to go to Thailand. So what will happen? I'm sorry, uh, if one person from a European country yeah. walks into... Yeah, yeah. Say, say, you're going to a Thai embassy and a uh, Thai consulate, right? Say, I, I would like to fly to Thailand next week. So what will happen to, it, to this person? Yes, 
the embassy will be advising them that um, they are encouraging for that person to postpone the trip for kind of obvious obvious reasons. Mm. Unless he or she have, have very essential business to attend to, right? That, that would have would be an exception for that. Yes. Uh, well, the uh, the for for essential uh, purposes uh, that can, that can be uh, conveyed and uh, considered. Mm. Of course. Uh, uh, as for the uh, prior announcement, uh, six groups of persons uh, can enter Thailand through Thai citizens or mm. uh, foreign diplomats and uh, di uh, foreign persons with work permits, uh, and then three or four other other groups. But but that uh, in, in general is on hold until fifteenth of April as a recommendation. Mm. So what do you think is the biggest challenge for the foreign ministry at the moment after the imposition of the curfew and the restrictions in travel? Yes, the most uh, difficult challenge is in implementing and conveying this to the uh, creating an understanding among the Thai community uh, as well. We do our best on the ground. I mean, when there was a need for the fit to fly or the certification of the embassy for for Thai people in the UK, they facilitated uh, that uh, registration. Some Thai citizens uh, work, frankly, work legally abroad, but we register them. We assist them. We go into the immigration system. So it's about implementing all of the measures. But I'm saying that, of course, these measures uh, are necessary in these times or in these challenging times. And we do our best on the ground abroad around the world to assist uh, Thai persons, as well as those foreign uh, citizens who uh, work or live in Thailand or want to travel to Thailand and do business in, in Thailand. OK. I'm very sorry that our live connection is not quite good in terms of voice quality, but thank you very much, Deputy Spokesman Natapanu Nopakun, for joining us. And I'm so sorry for the audience that perhaps you cannot clear the voice of Kun Natapanu quite clearly. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Okay. Thank you. And regarding the situation in China right now, we can see how imported cases of infection surpassed the local cases. And it's very challenging for the local authority in terms of Chinese custom. It has to be changed in order to cope with the infection, especially right now, the attention is on imported case. So let's take a look how they adapt to the new situation. As imported cases are on the rise, surpassing the number of new local cases. At the Shanghai Pudong International Airport, the country's largest port of entry by air, customs officers are boarding every inbound international flights to conduct quarantine inspections on every individuals on board. Custom officer Song Dan and colleagues just finished inspection on one flight. The process took about 45 minutes. She said that this was the 11th flight they boarded that day. Then they went through a disinfection process. According to regulations, they now need to conduct a full quarantine check on every international flight coming in, which does pose a great challenge to their staff's energy and ability to deal with various emergency situations. On their busiest day, Zong and colleagues had to work over 24 hours straight and inspect over 50 flights. With many COVID-19 cases showing no symptoms, every inspection needs to be thorough. Song said, the new coronavirus was extremely transmissive and it had many potentially asymptomatic infections. If a large number of high-risk passengers were to enter a closed environment, like the terminal building, there was a greater risk of the virus spreading.
Once they had identified high-risk personnel on the plane, they would immediately transfer them to a special examination and treatment area and conduct epidemiological investigations, medical investigation, and sampling, so as to avoid contact with other passengers and greatly reduce the risk of transmission. For over two months since administering pandemic prevention measures, Zong and colleagues have inspected 4,000 flights, 137,000 individuals from coronavirus hit countries and regions. And right now, Kun Nat Bunak is joining me to tell us more about the lockdown and curfew, which is happening with other countries as well. And Kun Thep Chai is also with us. Kun Thep Chai. Yes, I can hear you quite clearly. Yes. So as we as we say that in about three hours and yep. less than three hours right now, curfew will be in place in Thailand. So I'm pretty sure everyone is rushing home straight after the show. Yeah. Yeah. But what happens in other countries around the world in terms of their policy of curfew lockdown? So most countries, as you can see, that many countries choose to do similar things. For example, closing restaurants and bars and allowing them for only takeaway services and closing schools and universities as well. But let's clarify a bit between curfew and lockdown for those who are still using these words interchangeably. For a curfew, it's similar to what the Thai Prime Minister General Prayut Chan Ocha announced yesterday night, that the curfew is, is more like a government enforcement that requires residents to stay at home during certain times. So what the Prime Minister said yesterday was 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. But if it's a lockdown, it's more than a curfew. So. No one is allowed to leave or to enter freely, whether it's in a building or in an area. But if all places are closed, some places, depending on which country you're living in, there will be security forces, security checkpoints ar around the place. So they will, they will be there in case like to check whether the citizens actually comply with the measures announced yeah, by the government. Yeah. So in Thailand, it's mixing between curfew and lockdown, partial lockdown or yeah. whole lockdown in some provinces. But what happened in the US? Have they announced curfew or lockdown yet? To, to give you a bit of an update, uh, President Trump hasn't really mentioned about the lockdown. But what he has mentioned previously is that the next two weeks ahead, it will be a painful week for all Americans. But besides not mentioning the lockdown yet, but what he has mentioned is that he requested all citizens to comply with social distancing guidelines. But, bes but besides that, many of the states have decided to proceed with lockdowns and some with state of emergencies. For example, like in New York City, where there are many of new infections and pretty much the, like the highest in compared to other states and around the world. Also in New Jersey also has a lockdown as well. Yes, so that New York is epicenter of the yes. coronavirus mm -hmm. in the US. So they have imposed quite strict measure to fight against it. But I noticed that President Trump resists to use the word stay at home order or state yeah. order of staying at home. He still make a request like cooperation. Yes, because like stay at home is like the best thing that all Americans could do at this moment. So, so, I, so I'm guessing that despite that he has not really mentioned the word lockdown, but many states around the country has proceeded with lockdowns or even state of emergencies without the order from President Trump. Yeah, state of emergency has been announced about two weeks ago yeah. in the U.S. And what about in Europe? We can see how the situation is quite bad, especially in Italy, in Spain. They have already announced yeah. lockdown. Yes, there, there has been a lockdown in Italy. So if you remember 
back in the beginning of March. When you think of Venice or Milan, which when you think of these places, you will, the first thing you will think of is like not just the beautiful sceneries, but you will also think of the, the amount of tourists in that place. So when the lockdown was placed at the beginning of March, the whole scene is completely different. No tourists or even even the even Venice, where you would normally see gondola boats, they're they're so empty and everyone has decided to stay at home and not just travel. Yes, it must be quite challenging for Spaniard and Italian because it's their nature yeah. of fun loving, enjoy going exactly. out. But right now they have to quarantine, stay at home mostly. Yeah. What would you like to say, Kunte <laughs> Pashai? Now, to, going back to the U.S., I think it's very interesting that uh, within, I mean, few hours from now, uh, some kind of recommendation is expected from the White House on the need to wear face masks. And certainly this uh, departure from President Trump's early stand about this issue. Because a few weeks ago, he said that uh, Americans did not wear face masks because it wasn't necessary to help prevent the coronavirus. But after the country has become a new epicenter of the virus now, so every possible measure that they can think of are now being introduced. So the, the, the White House will be soon uh, issuing recommendations that Americans wear masks when they go out on the streets to reduce the chance of them getting uh, infected. But of course, this will not be mandatory. As the President Trump said today that uh, he believed that Americans, not everyone would want to wear face masks. So it's up to them to decide whether or not they want to wear one. But yeah. of course, the recommendation is that they should. <laughs> still using the word recommendation, still not yeah. compulsory. No. But it's the tip of the tone of using mm. the mask in the U.S. because previously even physicians told American citizens that they don't need to wear face mask. But right now, obviously, the tone has changed. Yeah, because no. during the beginning, like if we remember the, what President Trump has said, he's so positive and so optimistic about how will, how will the U.S. deal with the coronavirus. But recently, the way he talked to the press, everything has changed and he, it seems like he starts to admit that mm -hmm. it's a real pandemic. Yes, and closer to Thailand, Kunat, what about Philippines? The measure seems very, very tough. Very Between harsh as well. Because life and death. Very harsh as well because he decided to, to tell the citizens, if you do not comply with the rules, you'll get shot. Yeah, that's from How President Duterte. That? So, but that's real tough. That's real tough because I think because Philippines has a very huge population. So that is pretty much the best way to control their people during this pandemic. But another country who decided to take the harsh way, besides Philippines, India also took a very harsh way from mm -hmm bashing their citizens if they go go out in public. Yes, they have announced national lockdown for the whole country yeah. already since last week. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't that, let's hope that uh, the President Duterte's threat to have uh, violators of the lockdown shot uh, <laughs> be just another hyperbole for effect that he didn't really mean it. But he has the habit of saying things like this. But, ended up not doing anything, I mean, according to what he said. <laughs> he is known for making violent remarks anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, so hopefully there is just more like a threat rather than real action. Yeah, but let's I hope think, it's a, just yeah. another hyperbole from, from him. Yeah, and what, what else, what are other countries that you'd like to tell us more? One interesting point from Singapore. So when we talk about work from home, there is still a bit of flexibilities around the world. But for Singapore, all employers must allow their staff to work from home. So if any employer does not do that, they will get jailed or will get fined. And recently, they have already sent stop work orders to workplaces who have not done so. So it's around 129 stop work orders 
issued already to workplaces who have not allowed their employees to work from home. Yeah, Singapore is known as a country which have tough measure even before coronavirus, yeah. and it's been regarded as one of the successful country in dealing with it. So they have imposed strict measure, and they cannot just be laid back with the past success of fighting with coronavirus because of the new foreign arrivals. We can see how imported case become new threat or new trend regarding more cases. And it's not just for the lockdown or other measures that have been imposed. It's not really necessarily because of the the number of new infections or the increasing deaths. But for many countries, they decided to to toughen their measures, it's for their safety because I'm pretty sure that every single government around the world, their first priority is to save lives, and this is a real pandemic. So, the, so I'm pretty sure that every single government wants to save lives. Yes, and Kunet, you study in Australia before. Yes, I studied in Australia before. So, yeah. Yeah, well, speaking of Australia, it's not just Australians. It, there are plenty of international students, also permanent residents and temporary residents who are not Australians to begin with. So some from China, some from Indonesia, and many countries around the world. Recently, they just announced a lockdown in New South Wales. So mm -hmm. they have also mentioned that if anyone leaves their home without a good reason, they will be jailed or fined. Yeah. And New South Wales has a lot of new infections and deaths as well. Yeah. And, and if you remember, last month, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has also raised a travel ban to level four, which is the highest already. So level four means do not travel, do not go overseas. And he also mentioned if you're going overseas during your school holidays, please don't stay at home, even though the number of infections are not as high compared to other countries. but. The government has decided to toughen their measures to save people's lives, no matter what state they live in. Okay, thank you very much, Kunat, for telling us about what other countries are doing in terms of curfew, in terms of lockdown, in, in trying to fight coronavirus. And in Australia as well, right now we can see how social groups, volunteers are trying to help health personnel, medical personnel in the country. It's that how they group together for their work in this crisis. Australian community groups use social media to help medical workers and those in isolation amid the new coronavirus outbreak across the country. Packing meals and offering support networks in Melbourne. The Facebook group Adopt a Healthcare Workers Victoria helps people rally around the frontline staff battering the disease. While social media has been widely blamed for spreading dangerous coronavirus misinformation, Tens of thousands of Australians are using their networks to support the healthcare workers risking their lives on the front lines of the pandemic. The goal is to match volunteer helpers with adoptees, healthcare workers, struggling with increased work hours and the stress of fighting with the virus. The help on offer includes food shopping, delivering home-cooked meals, and lift to work for nurses, so they don't have to take public transport. I've got the boys here, but I'm overwhelmed by everything, especially the support we're getting from the community, um, the messages I'm getting every evening um, from people who've actually received the food, um, just thanking us, um, especially the nurses um, who are literally sending me messages and you can see it. you can feel the pain that they're going through looking after people and everything um, but overall it's just overwhelming tests that we can't help them do their jobs because we are not skilled but i can 
do their grocery shopping for them. And I can offer to babysit my brother's kid when he has to pick up an extra shift or something like that. So it's about helping with the practical side of life for our healthcare workers who are on the front line against this thing. Help medical personnel in fighting against coronavirus. Back to Thailand. Today, the government has announced the third round of economic package to try to alleviate, alleviate financial situation of people who are facing financial hardship because of coronavirus crisis. And right now, we have Kun Prin Panichapak, deputy leader and head of economic team, Democrat Party, with us. Okay. Hello, Kap. Kun Hello. Prin. Yes, so you are with us, and we are still waiting for Kun Thep Chai to Yes, I am join joining. The, yes, ha. I have joined the conversation. Kun Prin, hello, Kun how Prin. are you, Kun Prin? Can you turn on your camera, please? <laughs> ah, sorry, we'd like to see just, your face. Just, just, okay, just. we'd like to see your face, what it, <laughs> how it looks second. like um, in your comfort of your home. So how are you doing? <laughs> you must be sorry, safe God. and sound in the comfort of your home, right? <laughs> I, I try to, to work from home um, in the last few days, so we, we try our best as a couple okay. of... Uh, ministries who sometimes uh, they ask yeah. for meetings uh, in the ministry yeah. i have to go but but i try my best and i, I often mention to them that to to try to to allow us to also contribute from from home from where we are sorry what about the, the curfew the curfew it doesn't have any effect on you the curfew well not 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 really so far because um before the curfew happened i i usually try to come home uh, by 10 p.m. already anyway <laughs> so not, not no more of a much of a party animal so I've been okay, uh, okay. coming home relatively earlier and right. once at home though that's the issue because I, I try to go to bed a bit earlier and, and uh, people always say uh, building up a good immunity requires you to have a good <laughs> sleep and, and and often I struggle to sleep before midnight but I try my best to uh, okay. to get to bed before that you, it's you a new life a new lifestyle for you now right Kun Prin, yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt because we still cannot see your face. And can you put the set the phone landscape? Oh okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Landscape. Yes. I, okay. This okay. works. Okay. Okay. I, I I can see my own face, but I cannot see you. I can see Kun Tepe Chai. Okay. That's okay. But your your voice is clear. That's right. that's good uh, enough. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Yes. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on on, on the show. So how do you see the the latest economic package by the government of 1.6 trillion baht would be enough to help in this crisis? Well, um, um, to, to be fair, originally I was hoping um, to see an open-end um, kind of uh, ways of using the budget. By that I mean, I was looking at a German model. If you look at what mm. Chancellor um, in Germany has been announcing, um, she's been pretty clear that all the government budgets would be put in the middle um, to put all the focus and efforts on fighting the virus, mm. both in the healthcare sense of the word and also in the sense of the economic sense of the word. Because as you both you know, um, this is a healthcare, a public healthcare um, crisis first and foremost. But this public healthcare crisis clearly morphed into a giant economic crisis. So in order to ta tackle um, the real roots of the problems, um, they come together. You cannot just separate one from another. So now mm -hmm. the budget that was set a year ago is now clearly um, out of sync with the latest uh, situation of what is going mm -hmm. on. So for someone to suggest that it should be maybe take 10%, 15% mm -hmm. of the budget, um, of the fiscal annual budget uh, to tackle this virus, I don't think that is sufficient. I, I think I we need to look at this um, from a very open-minded angle mm, that mm, mm. this problem can be with us for a very long time. And for us to come out of this crisis in a stronger fashion, we need a budget that could tackle the short-term immediate needs, no doubt, of the doctors and nurses to provide mm -hmm. them with you know, necessary um, equipment for them to tackle, whether it's the ventilator, whether it's the... Um, the N95 mask, whether it's the appropriate uh, venue for them to contain the patient, the COVID patient, um, whether it's the development of the research and development budget for the mm -hmm. vaccine or for the medicines. You know, we, we, we don't want to be waiting for okay. Germany or America or China mm -hmm. to develop the vaccine for us and for us to wait three or six months down the road from them. Okay. We want to be at the forefront 
of this R&D where the Thai doctors and researchers are actually second to none. So why, mm -hmm. why can't we be the one who is leading the research and development uh, mm -hmm. for this vaccine? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, yes, the public health uh, needs much more budget. Um, but also, if you look at this um, from the fiscal yeah. stimulus mm -hmm. angle and the fiscal support, as well as the monetary support, we can do much more on both fronts. So you're suggesting a total rethink of how the budget this year will be spent, right? Co correct, yes. I've seen a few suggestions um, from, from people suggesting mm -hmm. to shave off from the budget to do with travel, to do with seminars, you know, to do with outings. Fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, those need to go away anyway. Those need to be redistributed towards the, the middle, you know, or emergency budget. But some yes. people are saying um, we may shave 10% off each ministry's I don't think that's enough. I don't think we need to do that 10%. You know, I, I think we really need to look hard at this of what is the necessary items of spending. Mm. And sometimes that those necessary items of spending doesn't mean shaving 10% of each ministry. It's actually mm. looking at um, the core of, of what is needed the most to be spending at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So for example, um, clearly, yes, the Ministry of Public Health will need a lot more funding. But even the Ministry of Social Welfare may need much mm. more mm. Uh, resources than it orig originally has, ha has provided for by the central government. You know, um, typically the social welfare ministry um, will need to look after the disabled people, the less well-off people, the old age uh, people, old age pensions. Mm. Um, you know, and, and in this time of crisis, you know, where inequality can be even wider, this mm. ministry of social welfare could need even more budget uh, to drive and, and to help uh, provide a cushion for the less well-off in the society. That's just an example, you know, there mm. could be other ministries, um, even Ministry of Agriculture, for example, that are already fighting um, on the front of water management. We're already facing a huge issue on the drought. Yeah. So yeah. how do we make sure that the farmers and people in the agricultural sectors who are relatively less well-off than most mm. of us, how do we make sure that the products that come out from that sector that you are seeing, yeah. plenty of supply coming out, mm. now is a mango season, so a lot of mangoes come out, and the <laughs> traditional market for mango, the South Korea, the yeah. China, the Japan. No more. <laughs> exactly. There is a no more or taking much less. Mm. So yeah. mango is a fruit that can go away rotten very okay. fast. So besides the preservation and the, yes. um, what do you call it, processing, the prayer root, yeah. how, mm. how do we then move up the value chain and provide the right uh, sort of budget uh, for, for all this, uh, moving up the value That's chain that. for the farmers and fruit growers as well? So the first thing that the government needs to do now is to sit down and reset the priorities for the countries under these new circumstances, right? Co correct, Kap Kun mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Setting priority in this crisis time mm -hmm. is so important, Kap. You've seen already that we're talking as if we're going to war. The Prime mm -hmm. Minister has said that we must win victory at all costs. And I think this victory is important because victory mm -hmm. could mean that we'll save you know, thousands of lives. You've seen already that the Italians have lost more than 10,000 lives. And the American looks set to follow that trend as well as the Spanish. So we definitely don't want our curve to go that direction. And for mm. us, um, um, for us to, to throw our resources, whatever it takes, uh, it really takes whatever it takes. Winston Churchill used to say once that it's not good enough to do what's necessary. You must, you must do beyond what's necessary and provide the victory. Make sure we get the mm. victory in, the, in this wartime. And, and there are so many events across the globe that's been cancelled for the first time since World War II. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. the, the, the financial bazooka, whether you mm -hmm. want to call it from the fiscal stimulus or whether you want to call it the monetary uh, wizardry of the QE quantitative easing response that you've seen from somewhere around the world. I'm not suggesting the Bank of Thailand need to go down the QE route, but mm -hmm. you, you saw the emergency bill that came out to, today announced by the governor and the governments on, on propping up the bond markets, the debt market, clearly show the signs that they're watching over this very carefully and very, very worried about what could happen in the financial market, especially in the debt market. And could bring with the registration of people who really need cash right now for 5,000 baht with three, three months in a row that they will get. Do you think that will be enough for immediate crisis for those people, like well, daily wage workers? No, this, uh, yes, that's a good question. And I think 5,000 baht for perhaps, I think initially was uh, three something million and now has branched out six million more, so about a total of nine million now. And I'm sure more will be forthcoming. I, I think 5,000 baht is a bare minimum start. Now, I, I think the next step for them to do is to set incentive 
ครับคุณนัทธา incentive I mean this is a time where a lot of people will be out of job a lot of people will be spending time just at home to save the nation you know stay at home for the nation mm -hmm. so for them to stay at home and do nothing and just get 5,000 baht as the minimum that's too little you know how do you incentivize them to go on to use online tools for them to increase their 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 skills Thailand need more skillful labor and we need to come out of this crisis sprinting out the block we don't want to come out as a sick man of Asia or the sick mm -hmm. man of ASEAN. We don't want to come out, you know, walking like a, a little shaken, kapek, kapek. We want to be running out of this crisis. So how do we do that? You know, there is a lot of online courses. In fact, the Ministry of Commerce have launched an online course called the Guru, G-U-R-U. Mm -hmm. And this is through the New Economy Academy at the Ministry of Commerce. So, you know, how do we promote this more effectively? How do we incentivize um, okay. the people around the country who are out of jobs, who are staying at home, to download these programs, to teach themselves online learning. Uh, Ministry of Education, Kunying Kalaya, Sopon Panit, um, the Deputy Minister there has already come out with coding lessons, with artificial mm. intelligence lessons, with various forms of classes online that could mm. be very useful. And of course, I mean, you know, abroad, people can look at MIT, Chicago, and various online courses around the world that they could download. But for a government in Thailand to be incentivized correctly for people to do that, some people even go to the lengths to say that mm -hmm. if per household, if there is no COVID uh, transmission, if they don't have any COVID disease uh, uh -huh. in the next three, three to six months, they're, in, they're entitled to a special payoff. You know, so this is one way perhaps mm -hmm. uh, to smartly incentivize people to stay at home because there's still a lot of youngsters understandably out there partying, out there seeing their friends. There's still some adults who are sneaking out in a curfew hours, doing mm. some things that they should not be doing. So yeah. th there are various incentives that we could use to entice people to stay at home and do productive things like online education to retool, mm. reskill, or upgrade the skills of the people so that when we come out of this crisis, in fact, this could be a great opportunity for the country. Yeah. I mean, it's always disputable as to how much money is, is needed for this kind of a crisis, right? The 1.6 trillion baht today could be too little or too much. I mean, it depends on, on, on how you look at, it, look at it. But one immediate challenge is that uh, there are now a lot of people who are going back to their hometowns, to the up, to up country, after losing their jobs or having made redundant. And the finance minister today, Kunotama, said that, well, uh, maybe these people don't need to come back because one of our policy is to promote local economy so that there will be jobs for these people. Do you think this is a, a good approach? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's always good in, in normal times as well as mm. perhaps in crisis time that, that we want to keep the good local people to work to promote and support their local community and be near their homes and their families. That way, the fabric, the social fabrics of community mm. and family can be stronger and I, I do support that I, I hope mm. that the local economy can come out of this stronger but for the local people to stay at home mm. in their provinces and not need to come back to the urbans um, you, you need a, a long-term strategic uh, thinking of how this mm. could be work out and that's why I say sometimes the whole amount of money that you ask a good question it, it doesn't I don't feel to be too too picky on the quantity mm. of the money mm -hmm. yeah. but but actually we have a lot of ammunition, I call it the bazooka. We have plenty of bazooka mm -hmm. left to shoot because we, we, are, we are debt to GDP is what, 42% in Thailand? So there's yeah, plenty yeah. of room to borrow mm -hmm. if we want to increase that side of debt. There are plenty of budget that can be reshift that I have talked about that can be readdressed uh, in, in this, in this uh, uh, crisis time. So therefore for us, the issue is not money, but how do we lay out a clear, short, middle, medium and long-term strategy for mm -hmm. us to come mm -hmm. out of this crisis? Once we drafted that plan now and the whole integrated efforts that now is centered upon the effort pushed from the Prime Minister and, and the center that fight against the COVID, I, I hope that the budget can be utilized to do the things mm -hmm. that you mentioned. If you want people to stay at home and, and push their local economy, there must be credible and good enough income jobs for those people, whether it's in yeah, the agricultural yeah. sector, you know, we need people to duck up more canals and more, and more uh, gambling, more um, reservoir for the water. Um, per each uh, plantation. So that needs to be done in the agricultural sector. Uh, we need more people perhaps in the services sector, in the local community tourism, for those people to go back and develop their own uh, local community-based efforts. Uh, so maybe they can do that. We need people perhaps to be more on the front footing for local innovation of how they would uh, process the agricultural products to move up the mm. value chain. You know, we could look at ways of yeah. utilizing the online platform 
of how they can work from home now that people are more familiar with using Microsoft Team or the Facebook that we're using, you know, or the group line call or Zoom program. There are various tools that people can actually work from home, yeah. do e-commerce, do online businesses, yeah, yeah. And, and I think this is going to change the way people live and work. Yeah. yeah. Kun Prin, I asked this question to you before, but I'll ask again. How do you see this crisis? And when you compare with Tom Yam Gung crisis in 1997, how are we going to come out of this, the two crises differently? Yes, I mean, this is a very different crisis because in 1997, Tom Yam Gung, uh, the people who hurt the most were people from the, the bigger guys, the upper echelon of the society the corporates you know, that were hurt because of the huge amount of private sector debt and a huge amount of um, leverage that was put on in the corporate sectors and, and the bigger guys. This time around, the people who are hurt the most are the most vulnerable, the smaller guys, upcountry, the SMEs, small medium enterprises, the startup, the social entrepreneurs, you know, people who are relatively the individuals, you know, who the household debt, which is already high, those are the guys who are suffering the most, you know, who are working part time, who have the jobs, relatively less job security. So the way we're going to come out of this, you're going to see differences in the way we tackle it because this time mm -hmm. round, we need to provide more social infrastructure for these people. You know, clearly we'll fail them on the public health front. Clearly we'll fail them on the social welfare front. Clearly we'll fail them from the educational front in the longer term. So how do we look at this in the, in the holistic way, in the integrated effort from the birth eye view and come out of this that we need a more long-term strategic planning. I don't want to use the word the national strategy 20-year plan, but a country, any country mm -hmm. who is going to be successful in the longer term to reduce the level of inequality in the society and, and bring about a more equitable, long-term, sustainable development growth that you are aware of, you know, the uh, 17 goals of UN Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. Any country who wants to achieve those goals, you need a long-term strategic plan to grow and Thailand has that, but mm. many critiques sometimes play too much politics around the national 20-year strategy. And I don't think we should play politics around the longer-term national strategy. You know, whether it's 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, we do need a longer-term plan and the implement, implementation plan and mm -hmm. effort to implement those plans in the 3, 5, 10 years that, that is needed. So I hope we come out of this crisis uh, looking at this that we should not be too much picky on the quality, so sorry, the quantity of growth, mm -hmm. the GDP figures itself, whether this year that the Bank of Thailand say minus 5.3%, mm -hmm. so what? It could be minus 10, it could be minus 9, minus 4. It doesn't matter. If we need to look at the quality of the recovery and the quality of growth that will bring about to lessen the inequality of this society. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Kun Prin, for English version, but please hold on, Don. Hang the light, dot hang to please hold on with us because I would like you to see and Kuntep Chai, please watch this as well. The survivor of COVID-19 in the US have been working in the research lab and they donate their antibody in the hope that we can fight this virus and can have the result of vaccine as soon as we can. And after this, we will come back and discuss more with Kun Prin in Thai. So Kun Prin, please hold on with us. Thank you. In New York, United States, there's a recovered COVID-19 patient who's eager to join the battle against the coronavirus pandemic by donating her antibodies. Diana Berendt, a 45 years old mom who has chronicled for her entire ordeal since testing positive for the COVID-19. Last week, after her recovery, She's finally out of the isolation and decided to donate her blood and plasma to potentially help other victims. Since she was one of the first people in her area to be diagnosed with COVID-19, she knew right away that she could also be one of the first survivors and she realized that this is her responsibility and opportunity to do something. We can be superheroes. We can, we are in, we are living in a state right now where we have no control over anything. This, these are unprecedented, frightening times where everything is beyond our control, except for we as survivors can help. We can be the ones running towards the fire 
in our own internally built hazmat suit. Besides her blood and plasma donation, she also established a grassroots movement on a public Facebook group called Survivor Corps in order to identify survivors and connect them with research institutions as their antibodies can be used to potentially save the lives of others. Right now, Survivor Corps has garnered around 18,000 members. And we are keeping a running list of every uh, study that we can find around the country and making those available and acting as a matchmaker of sorts between research institutes and survivors to make the system more efficient and expedite the process because we don't have time to waste. Lives are on the line. Eldad Hot, transfusion medicine doctors leading trials at Columbia University's Irving Medical Center, insists on the importance of participation from potential donors like Diana. And I hope, Phil, that at the end of the day, science will win. It's really important to have enough plasma in our supply so that we can support the trials and support the compassionate use, because otherwise we won't be able to figure out where this works best. But people have put their egos aside and banded together to try to work together for the common good. And I think in the end, science will win out. And so um, I think I am hopeful um, and I'm hopeful um, that something will eventually work and slow the, the, the virus and, and buy us more time. And, and eventually we will have either a vaccine or a drug that will prevent um, the severe illness. <laughs> คุณปรินคุณเทพชัยยังอยู่กับดิฉันนะคะกลับมาคุยกันเป็นภาษาไทยค่ะสําหรับไทยพีบีเอสเวิลด์ทูไนท์ภาคภาษาไทยค่ะ
เออเราทุกคนตอนนี้เป็นห่วงทั้งหมอทั้งพยาบาลทั้งทัพหน้านะครับแม้ว่าการขาดแคลนของหน้ากาก N95 เครื่องช่วยหายใจนะครับจำนวนเตียงหรือว่าสถานที่จะกักตัวอย่างเหมาะสมเนี่ยนะครับรวมไปถึงการค้นคว้าวิจัยหาวัคซีนที่มาช่วยแก้ไวรัสโควิดเนี่ยอันนี้เป็นสิ่งที่เราเราต้องใช้งบประมาณเต็มที่อยู่แล้วครับเพื่อใช้สาระสุขเราเดินหน้าต่อไปได้แต่ผู้ถูกเลยครับเหนือสิ่งอื่นใดครับในสถานการณ์ที่เราทุกคนต้องอยู่บ้านเพื่อจะหยุดเชื้อเพื่อช่วยชาติเนี่ยนะครับรัฐบาลควรจะมองหาวิธีที่เฉลียวฉลาดในการที่จะสร้างแรงจูงใจให้คนที่อยู่กับบ้านเนี่ยนะครับได้สร้างเสริมทักษะสมรรถนะเรียนรู้ออนไลน์นะครับทำให้ชีวิตเราที่ปรับตัวที่ชินกับการอยู่กับดิจิตอลเนี่ยนะครับเป็นอะไรที่จะเพิ่มมูลค่าสูงมหาศาลให้กับประเทศไทยในอนาคตได้เนี่ยถือโอกาสสร้างแรงงานฝีมือใหม่ๆเลยครับแล้วก็เป็นโอกาสดีเลยครับรัฐต้องหาวิธีที่เฉลียวฉลาดในการจูงใจนะครับให้เป็นประโยชน์ที่แต่ละคนอยู่กับบ้านแล้วไม่ไม่เสียโอกาสนะครับไม่ไม่ใช่แค่ว่านอนสั่งอาหารเดลิเวอรี่อยู่กับบ้านแล้วกินเป็นอ้วนแต่ว่าต้องต้องอิ่มอิ่มพุงไม่พอต้องอิ่มความรู้ในสมองด้วยกับการเรียนรู้ออนไลน์ครับคุณปิงครับปกติวิกฤตทุกครั้งเนี่ยมันจะเป็นบททดสอบความแข็งแกร่งของสังคมใช่ไหมครับคุณปิงเองมองว่าเที่ยวนี้เราเราเรารับมือกับมันแล้วมันมันถือว่าคะแนนเราอยู่ตรงไหนได้จริงๆนะครับก็ต้องยอมรับว่าคนไทยเราจริงๆโดยพื้นฐานจิตใจนิสัยใจคอผมว่าเป็นคนที่มีความเอื้อเฟื้อเผื่อแผ่ผมอ้อมอารีอยู่แล้วนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นต้นทุนทางสังคมในลักษณะที่รายบุคคลของการที่แต่ละคนร่วมบริจาคนะครับหรือร่วมที่เอกชนเห็นออกไปบริจาคนะครับจะเป็นเครื่องช่วยหายใจจะเป็นบริจาคหน้ากากอนามัยให้กับหมอหน้ากาก N95 นะครับชุด PPE ต่างๆผมเห็นหลายภาคส่วนพยายามที่จะผลักดันให้เกิดตรงนี้นะครับคราวนี้มันก็ขึ้นอยู่กับภาครัฐแล้วล่ะครับซึ่งจริงภาครัฐเนี่ยต้องเป็นผู้นําเวลาเกิดวิกฤตอย่างนี้นะครับซึ่งโอเคครับถึงแม้ผมไม่ได้อยู่ในคอรมอชุดนี้แต่ทางพรรคประชาธิปัตย์เองเราก็พยายามนําเสนออย่างสร้างสรรค์น,นะครับเป็นกระบอกเสียงซึ่งเราไม่ต้องการมาเล่นการเมืองนะครับเราคิดว่าการแนะนําอย่างสร้างสรรค์น,นะครับผ่านทางรัฐมนตรีของเราเจท่านรวมถึงกระบอกเสียงจากทางตัวแทนสสในท้องถิ่นแล้วก็จากผู้บริหารพรรคนะครับไปสู่คอรมอเนี่ยก็เป็นเรื่องสร้างสรรค์ว่าทํายังไงที่เราคิดว่าตัวภาครัฐเองต้องโชว์ความเป็นผู้นําในการที่จะสร้างตัวอย่างที่ดีให้กับสังคมเดินตามนะครับไม่ว่าจะเป็นเรื่องอย่างที่เราคุยกันนะครับเรื่องอยู่กับบ้านใช่ไหมครับทํางานจากบ้านอันนี้ภาครัฐก็ต้องเป็นเป็นผู้นําทางสังคมนะครับเราพูดเรื่องไวรัสที่มันรามไปเยอะมากตอนนี้เรื่องข่าวปลอมใช่ไหมครับภาครัฐเองก็ต้องเป็นตัวนําในการที่จะสร้างองค์ความรู้ที่ถูกต้องให้กับประชาชนและกระจายข่าวสารที่ถูกต้องทันไวได้ทันท่วงทีให้กับประชาชนทั่วประเทศด้วยในความรู้เรื่องกักตัวเรื่องอยู่กับบ้านหรือทําอะไรได้บ้างตอนอยู่กับบ้านผมว่าสิ่งเหล่านี้เป็นเป็นเรื่องที่ภาครัฐเองต้องทํากันบ้านหนักขึ้นนะครับครับฟังดูแล้วเหมือนว่าทางคนสังคมไทยสอบผ่านแต่ว่าการนําทางการเมืองก็เป็นอีกประเด็นหนึ่งผมผมคิดว่าในทุกวิกฤตจริงๆเห็นใจนะครับก่อนอื่นที่จะพูดจริงๆจะติชมใครเนี่ยผมเห็นใจอย่างมากเพราะว่ารัฐมนตรีแต่ละท่านก็ทํางานอย่างหนักเหนื่อยเหน็ดเหนื่อยท่านนายกเองก็มีความหวังดีที่จะให้เราทุกคนชนะไวรัสนี้ได้ในเร็ววันนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นเห็นใจครับทุกประเทศจริงๆเจอคําติชมหมดนะครับไม่ใช่แค่ประเทศไทยที่มีปัญหาในด้านการบริหารจัดการของภาครัฐนะครับเพียงแต่คราวนี้ครับมันถึงในช่วงที่วิกฤตเนี่ยผมช่วยเราทุกคนสมานสามัคคีและเป็นหนึ่งใจเดียวกันในการนําเสนอไอเดียดีๆให้ภาครัฐเอาไปต่อยอดได้เนี่ยนะครับจริงๆแล้วมีเอกชนหลายคนเก่งๆนะครับที่พัฒนาสิ่งที่เรียกว่าไอตัว rapid test kit เนี่ยบางทีภาครัฐก็ต้องฟังเอกชนเหมือนกันกลุ่มสตาร์ทอัพเก่งๆเนี่ยสามารถพัฒนาการกระบวนการเทสให้รู้ว่าคุณเป็นโควิดหรือไม่เป็นเนี่ยภายในเวลาแค่ไม่กี่ชั่วโมงนะครับแล้วความแม่นยําก็มีครับเพราะฉะนั้นภาครัฐก็ต้องฟังเอกชนในบ้านเราเหมือนกันเพราะการที่เราจะเทสทดสอบว่าใครเป็นโควิดได้จํานวนมากๆได้เนี่ยเป็นเรื่องสําคัญประเด็นแรกๆเลยครับ,รบอันที่2เอกชนก็เริ่มทําเรื่องที่กักตัวสถานที่ที่จะใช้กักตัวอย่างปลอดภัยได้อย่างมีมาตรฐานถูกทางสุขลักษณะของกระทรวงสาธารณสุขได้ก็ต้องให้โอกาสเอกชนมาให้การบริการด้านนี้ด้วยใช่ไหมครับและเรื่อง3ก็คือว่าภาคเอกชนรวมกับภาครัฐหรือภาควิชาการเนี่ยประเทศเรามีหมอที่ไม่เป็น2รองใครในด้านการวิจัยและพัฒนาเพราะฉะน
แต่ว่าหลายองค์กรในประเทศไทยยังกล้ากลัวกลัวใช่ไหมครับยังไม่กล้าเอามาใช้เต็มที่หลังจากที่เกิดวิกฤตครั้งนี้เนี่ยผมคิดว่าหลายองค์กรที่มองว่าการที่แค่ใช้กลไกเทคโนโลยีอย่าง VPN การประชุมโดยการที่อยู่กับบ้านหรือประชุมจากอยู่ที่ใดที่หนึ่งนะครับเป็นแค่เรื่องที่ทําแผนการเวลาฉุกเฉินใช่ไหมครับแต่ว่าจริงๆแล้วเนี่ยมันเป็นยุทธศาสตร์ใหม่ได้แล้วสามารถสร้างมูลค่าเพิ่มให้กับองค์กรได้นะครับแล้วมิติของการที่มองในเรื่องคุณภาพของการเติบโตคุณภาพของชีวิตนะครับคุณภาพของทรัพยากรสิ่งแวดล้อมทุกวันนี้อันนี้ผมไม่ได้เชียร์ว่าเราให้มีไวรัสเพื่ออากาศจะบริสุทธิ์ขึ้นนะครับแต่ว่ามันกลายเป็นว่าอากาศสีเขียวในกรุงเทพตัวเลข AQI หรือหลายพื้นที่เนี่ยนะครับที่เราไม่ได้เห็นมานานแล้วเนี่ยมันกลายเป็นว่าเฮ้ยทำไมสิ่งแวดล้อมสําคัญที่เราดีๆอากาศหายใจสําคัญนะสิ่งเหล่านี้ครับเราก็ต้องกลับมาคิดเหมือนกันว่าโมเดลของการพัฒนาหรือการเติบโตอย่างยั่งยืนที่ไปอิง17ข้อของการพัฒนาอย่างยั่งยืนขององค์กรสหประชาชาติที่ UN เนี่ยมันมีความสําคัญนะนะครับเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงนะครับของพ่อหลวงรัชกาลที่9ของเราที่พระองค์ท่านได้ทรงเป็นผู้นําในโมเดลการพัฒนาอย่างการเติบโตอย่างโมเดลเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงเนี่ยต้องเอามาใช้อย่างจริงจังนะครับเราเห็นแล้วว่าในลักษณะที่ทุกคนต้องอยู่กับบ้านหรืออาจจะบางคนที่อยู่ต่างจังหวัดสามารถปลูกพืชสวนสามารถมีมีทานมีใช้พอเพียงในบ้านในชุมชนตัวเองได้เนี่ยครับอันนี้คือความความพิเศษนะครับของลักษณะของเศรษฐกิจไทยที่สามารถนําเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงของพ่อหลวงรัชกาลที่9มาใช้ได้เลยนะครับครับคุณเป็นคิดว่ามีความจําเป็นไหมครับที่รัฐบาลอาจจะต้องนั่งลงพูดคุยอย่างจริงจังเพื่อที่จะปรับดูทิศทางของประเทศนะครับแล้วก็ปรับงบประมาณที่ที่กำลังใช้กันอยู่แต่ตอนนี้นะครับเพื่อที่จะจัดลำดับความสําคัญของเรื่องที่ต้องทำเนี่ยภายใต้บริบทใหม่เพราะว่าไอ้ผลจากไอ้ไอ้ไอ้โครโรนาไวรัสตรงนี้ถูกถูกต้องเลยครับคุณเทพประชัยครับผมคิดว่ารัฐบาลต้องทำเรื่องนี้จริงจังมากเพราะว่าการตั้งงบประมาณแต่ละปีเนี่ยบางทีก็ทำหนึ่งปีล่วงหน้าใช่ไหมครับแล้วบางทีสถานการณ์ปัจจุบันมันวิกฤตแล้วมันเกิดขึ้นอย่างฉับพลันโดยที่ไม่มีนักเศรษฐศาสตร์หรือนักสังคมศาสตร์คนไหนคาดการได้นะครับว่าจะเกิดวิกฤตทางสาธารณสุขและไวรัสตัวนี้ได้เนี่ยเพราะฉะนั้นงบประมาณที่ทํามาเมื่อหนึ่งปีที่แล้วเนี่ยมันไม่ทันการนะครับเราต้องมาปรับดูแล้วก็อย่าอย่ามาเถียงกันแค่ว่าจะเอาต้องเอางบแต่ละกระทรวงแค่สิเอร์เซนหรืออะไรมากองตรงกลางนะครับผมคิดมันต้องคิดมากกว่านั้นนะครับเพราะเราต้องคิดเราต้องคิดไม่ใช่แค่จะแก้ปัญหาเฉพาะหน้าที่เป็นเรื่องระยะสั้นในเรื่องการที่เราจะสู้ชนะไวรัสแต่ต้องคิดปัญหาในเชิงปรับโครงสร้างประเทศเราในเชิงระยะกลางระยะยาวด้วยว่ารอบนี้เราเห็นแล้วว่านะครับทุนสังคมในเชิงที่เป็นโครงสร้างพื้นฐานในเชิงสังคมที่เขาเรียกกันว่าโซเชียลอินฟราสตรักเจอร์เนี่ยเรามีไม่พอจริงๆนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นการลงทุนระยะยาวในด้านสาธารณสุขในด้านการวิจัยและพัฒนานะครับในด้านที่เกี่ยวข้องกับการศึกษาในด้านการสร้างแรงงานฝีมือให้ทันท่วงทีในเรื่องดิจิทัลทรานส์โอมิชันเนี่ยเรายังล้าหลังหลายประเทศมากเพราะฉะนั้นทํายังไงตรงนี้ครับที่เราจะมองออการฟื้นฟูเศรษฐกิจรอบนี้นะครับแล้วก็เยียวยารอบนี้เนี่ยไม่ใช่แค่เป็นเรื่องเฉพาะหน้าแก้ปัญหาไปวันวันวันต่อวันแต่เป็นการที่เราจะใช้โอกาสนี้ครับพลิกวิกฤตให้เป็นโอกาสที่จะทําให้เรามีบทเรียนครั้งนี้แล้วแล้วเรียกว่าพยายามลงมือทําจริงๆกับการขับเคลื่อนยุทธศาสตร์ชาติระยะยาวนะครับให้เป็นแผนที่ทุกคนจะต้องทําให้จริงจังเพื่อพัฒนาทั้งทรัพยากรมนุษย์แล้วก็คุณภาพของเทคโนโลยีทันสมัยมาให้ใช้ครับครับเอาละค่ะก็น่าจะมีโอกาสรออยู่ในวิกฤตที่กําลังเกิดขึ้นนะคะถ้าตั้งหลักกันให้ดีปรับเป็นระยะยาวแล้วก็วางรากฐานเศรษฐกิจก็น่าจะช่วยให้ฟื้นแล้วก็อยู่รอดกันในระยะยาวด้วยนะคะวันนี้ขอบคุณค,คุณปรินมากค่ะที่เข้ามาคุยในรายการทั้งสองภาษาเลยนะคะขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณคุณปรินมากครับและสโลแกนของเราก็คือ stay home and stay informed with Thai PBS ใช่ค่ะขอบคุณมากคุณเทพประชัยครับขอบคุณนักถามมากครับครับสวัสดีครับค่ะขอบคุณคุณปรินค่ะเอาละค่ะคุณเทพชัยทั้งหมดก็คือไทย PBS World Tonight สำหรับคืนนี้นะคะซึ่งเราได้ติดตามสถานการณ์ทั้งภาษาอังกฤษภาษาไทยเคอร์ฟิลนี้ก็อีกประมาณ1ชั่วโมงครึ่งค่ะคุณเทพชัยจะได้เวลามีผลบังคับใช้แล้วนะคะครับแล้วคุณนัฐานจะกลับบ้านยังไงคืนนี้ก็ยังเดาไม่ออกเลยใช่
่สามารถจัดรายการพูดคุยกันได้นะคะดิฉันอยู่ที่สถานีทีมงานอยู่ที่สถานีคุณเทพชัยรายงานสดวิเคราะห์กันตรงๆจากบ้านเลยและทั้งหมดก็คือไทย PBS World Tonight ทั้งภาคภาษาอังกฤษและภาษาไทยสำหรับคืนนี้ค่ะคุณเทพชัยยองและดิฉันนัทธาโกมลวาทินลาไปก่อนค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับ